Welcome everyone to our coffee break with the Saskatoon Council on Aging. My name is Leanza Maya, and I'm a fourth year nursing student with the College of Nursing at the University of Saskatchewan. And I'm currently completing my community placement with the Saskatoon Council on Aging. For guests who may be new to the Saskatoon Council on Aging, they offer many services, which include information referrals and pamphlet resources of interest to older adults, a free monthly social program called Seniors Neighborhood Hub Club, lifelong learning programs, a telephone buddy program, a seniors mastering technology program, the Century Club, which is for older adults over the age of 90, the Globe Walk program to help you keep motivated during winter months by forming teams and staying active, a free directory of services and activities for older adults, monthly newsletters to keep you informed about events, caregiver information and support services. They identify and act on unmet needs of older adults, and they support older adults to lead healthy, independent lives and to be active and socially engaged. Call any time at 306-652-2255 to find out more. If you have any questions during this webinar, just pop them into the chat. The icon's just at the bottom of the screen. And also there are students available to provide technical support. If you need help during this, just give them a call at 306-966-2496. I now welcome our guests, Erin Yakuchuk and Jesse Vidic. Erin is an assistant professor in the College of Pharmacy and Nutrition and the pharmacist with the Geriatric Evaluation and Management Program at Saskatoon City Hospital. She is a board certified geriatric pharmacist and her teaching and research interests include optimizing medications in older adults. And Jesse is a fourth year pharmacy student at the University of Saskatchewan, interning under Erin to gain experience in the field of geriatrics. She cares deeply about the older adult population aiming to decrease harm and hospitalizations and complications related to medications and disease. Born in Regina, Jessie enjoys reading, playing volleyball and creating realistic fine art in her spare time. Having earned a Bachelor of Science in Biology degree in 2017, she is now en route to graduate this June with her Doctor of Pharmacy and looks forward to becoming your next, neighbor, your next friendly neighborhood pharmacist. Thanks to both of you for joining us today. So we have several topics to be discussed. And again, if you have any questions, just pop them into the chat and we will answer them at the end of this presentation. So I'm just gonna start by sharing my screen and we can get started. All right, so today's presentation is about what pharmacists can do for you. We are going to discuss various topics related to medications, medication management, and pharmacy services that can be utilized by older adults. So first topic to discuss is polypharmacy. So Erin and Jesse, what is polypharmacy and why is it important? Oh, me, great question. And I just wanna say thanks so much for having us here today. I'm really looking forward to hopefully providing a little bit of information and then having a little bit of a discussion afterwards. Uh, so like, uh, like Leanza said, we're really interested in what you wanna learn about or would like to know more about. So please uh, think about questions and feel free to pop them into the chat and we'll address as many as we can. So to start off with polypharmacy. So this is a big uh, buzzword in the medical literature. And um, basically what it means is being on a lot of different medications. And what constitutes a lot of medications isn't something that there's a universal agreement on. Uh, most references support that being on five or more medications at the same time does potentially increase the risk for some medication adverse effects that we'll talk about. Um, in particular, as we age, we do tend to develop more medical conditions over time that need to be managed at the same time. And so often this means that we do need to be on medications, perhaps to control high blood pressure or to bring blood sugars down or for arthritis pain or for other different conditions. So it's not always a bad thing to be on a lot of medications and certainly some of the time being on a lot of medications is actually important for maintaining good health and being able to function the way we want to. Um, but however, the flip side of that is that being on a lot of medications does require closer follow-up by your healthcare team, including your pharmacist, 
to make sure that all of the medications that you're taking are working well for you um, and that they're not causing or contributing to any problems. So in particular, sometimes what we see is a lot of people are taking a lot of different medications and some of them maybe don't seem to have a reason for, for you to be taking them anymore. And so those are medications that can contribute to problems like drug side effects or interactions with other medications that you do need to take without really giving you any benefit. We also worry that you might be taking some medications that are inappropriate. And so as we'll talk about, uh, when, as we age, the way medications behave in our body does change. And so over time, medications that you were taking that were maybe appropriate at one point in time are no longer the best choice for you based on other changes in your health, other medications that you might be taking, or just changes in the body that can happen with aging. So kind of the bottom line with polypharmacy is that there's no right number of medications to be on. Um, what we're more concerned about is that you're taking the right medication and everything that you're taking is working the way that it should be and that none of the medications you're taking are contributing to any other problems or medical issues that you might have. Great, thank you. So next question, what are some changes that happen in our body as we grow and how does that affect your body's response to medication? All right, great question. And I love this question because I think there's a general underappreciation for the fact that our bodies do change with aging in important ways. And a lot of what we know about medications and their response um, is taken from studies in generally younger and healthier patient populations. And so uh, it's really important to know that because a medication was safe and appropriate for you five years ago or 10 years ago, it may not necessarily be the best choice anymore. And so we've chosen to highlight a few of the changes that happen in the body with aging. Obviously, we're not going to talk about, talk about all of them, and there's not going to be a test on any of this, um, but just kind of as some examples for some of these changes that happen and how they can affect medication response. So one thing that we see is a reduction in how acidic our stomach is with aging. And so this may sound like a good thing, right? If our stomach is less acidic, then maybe we're going to be less likely to develop heartburn or some other problems because, because of stomach acid. Um, but unfortunately, uh, what we actually see is that stomach acid is a really important protective mechanism for the stomach in terms of preventing infection. And it's also important for medication absorption in some cases as well. So we do see that as stomach acid declines, uh, medications that really like that acid environment and need that to be well absorbed are no longer absorbed as well anymore. And so we'll talk a little bit more about this later in the presentation, but this affects some non-prescription medications like uh, iron supplements or calcium carbonate, which is a really common calcium supplement, and also some medications that we might take for fungal infections as well. Um, so just kind of as an example, that's one age-related change that we need to consider when we're looking at your medication regimen. Another really important change that happens with aging is that our body proportions change quite a lot, starting at around age 30 and every decade thereafter, there's about a 10% swing in increase in our relative body fat content and decrease in uh, what we call our body water content. And basically this is referring to our muscle mass or our lean body tissue. And so many medications have an affinity for either body fat or body water. And just like oil and water, the two don't necessarily mix very well. So what we see with aging, um, in particular with medications that absorb really well in fat or are really fat soluble, they have a lot more places to hang out in the body as our proportion of body fat increases. And so what this means is that they tend to hang around a lot longer than they would in the general population. So we see, for example, a medication called diazepam, which is commonly used for anxiety type conditions. 
has a half-life of um, just under 24 hours in the general population, but a half-life of about three days when given to an older adult. So if what we're looking for is an immediate anti-anxiety effect, we also have to be aware that we're still going to be seeing the effects of that medication three to five days later in an older individual, just because it's going to hang around in the body that much longer. The flip side is that with decreased lean body mass, medications that are really water soluble have many fewer places in the body to hide out. So they tend to hang around in the bloodstream instead of distributing out into our body tissues. And what this means is there's a lot more medication that is left in the bloodstream and is available to act on the pharmacological receptors in the body. And so we see a much higher response to some medications that are really water soluble in older adults. And so an example of this one is a heart medication called digoxin. So older adults often require a much lower dose of digoxin to get the same therapeutic effect um, that we would see in a younger adult, just because so much more of it is hanging around in the bloodstream. We also see changes to the way the liver breaks down medications. So our liver is a really important organ for breaking down medications and helping to deactivate them in the body. So as we age, uh, we do tend to see slowing in some of those processes. And so again, this leads to more medication being active in the body for longer and able to have its effect or adverse effects as the case may be. Similarly, our kidney function also slows down with aging, and our kidneys are a really important way that our body eliminates medication from, from its uh, circulation or its effect. And so for medications that really rely on the kidneys in order to eliminate them from the body, we're going to see those medications uh, sticking around in the body a lot longer and able to, have, um, able to have an effect for longer than what we might expect. So these are just a few of the examples of ways that our body does change with aging and how this can affect medication response. And I really think the key message here is just again that medication response can change over time. So it's really important to have ongoing medication reviews with your doctor and or your pharmacist to make sure that what you're taking is still the best choice for you. Yeah, I agree. Those are very important things to keep in mind. All right, so on to our next question. How do some medications contribute to falls and cognitive impairment? Which ones and how can we solve this? Yeah, so this is a really good question, and this is something that I see really commonly in my work with uh, the geriatrics program, which we'll talk about a little bit more shortly. Um, but it is important to know that medications can potentially be a risk factor for falls. And what's important about that is medications are often a modifiable risk factor. So there are other fall risk factors that we really can't do anything about. You know, we can't, we can't rewind the clock and change aging. We can't change your gender or some of these other things. But um, what we can do is reevaluate your medications. So if you're at high risk for falls or if you've had falls in the past, then we really want to take a close look at your medications and make sure none of those are contributing to further increasing your fall risk and your likelihood of having a fall in the future. So some medications that uh, we are particularly concerned about are medications that cause drowsiness or dizziness as a side effect. So you've probably seen this a lot on medication bottles. Many of them come with the warning for the potential to cause that side effect. And that is something that we wanna keep a really close eye out for. Um, and particularly if we start seeing changes in balance or we start seeing falls, then those are medications that we might need to take a step back and reevaluate. So some examples of medications that we see really commonly as having these effects are sleeping pills. So again, we're taking a sleeping pill with the hope that it's going to make us drowsy and help us to sleep better at night. But the flip side of that is that then we might be more drowsy if we do have to get up at night to use the washroom or something like that, a little bit more unsteady on our feet and more likely to have a fall. 
Other medications that are kind of big flags for the drowsiness and dizziness type of side effect are uh, some muscle relaxants. Um, so a lot of them you can even buy over the counter. So things like uh, the Robaxacet or Robaxasol products that contain methylcarbamol, those are really notorious for, calling, for causing that confusion or um, drowsiness, dizziness as a side effect. And so something that generally speaking, we want to avoid in anybody with risk factors for falls. Other medications that can potentially have these adverse effects that we want to mo keep monitoring for include antidepressants. So medications that you might be taking to help with low mood or anxiety or antipsychotic medications as well, which um, is, is a terrible name for a class of medications because they can be used for many things and not just necessarily psychosis. Um, but these include medications like risperidone or quetiapine um, that can also cause that drowsiness, dizziness side effect that we'd want to keep an eye out for if you are taking those medications. Other classes of medications that we want to have a close look at if you are experiencing falls include medications for high blood pressure. And so again, we need to keep high blood pressure under control because we don't want to increase the risk for heart attacks and strokes and that kind of thing. But on the flip side, uh, your brain needs a good supply of blood in order to function properly. And so blood pressure is part of how, how our body regulates that. So if your blood pressure is getting too low, then your brain really doesn't function as well as it needs to. And you can start to see things like dizziness or unsteadiness on your feet, or maybe that feeling of lightheadedness, for example, when you go from sitting or lying down to standing up. So then we do want to take a close look at your blood pressure and make sure that you're not experiencing blood pressures that are going too low uh, when you're sitting down or when you go from sitting or uh, lying down to standing up. So we want to make sure that your blood pressure is staying where it needs to be and we're not lowering it too much. So we're increasing your risk for falls. Another body system that we need to consider when looking at fall risk is diabetes. So once again, controlling high blood sugar is important to prevent a lot of the complications of diabetes that you're probably familiar with, including eye problems and kidney problems and all of those sorts of things. Um, but once again, blood sugar or sugar is our brain's main source of fuel. So our brain is very sensitive to not getting enough sugar in order to function well. So in anybody that's experiencing falls that also has diabetes, and particularly is on medications to control their diabetes, we need to take a close look to make sure that not only are you not becoming hyperglycemic or having too much blood in your bloodstream, so your medications are doing what they should there, but also that you're not becoming hypoglycemic or having low blood sugar levels that, again, affects how well the brain can function and can increase your risk for having falls or for other problems as well. So those are some of the key issues that we look at in somebody that either has risk factors for or is experiencing falls and some of the medication adjustments or things that we, we might recommend making based on that. In terms of how medications can affect thinking and how medications can potentially contribute to cognitive changes, um, there's a couple of uh, main medication classes that we worry about for this. Um, so any medication that affects the brain, either directly or indirectly, can potentially have an impact on cognition that we would need to monitor for. But in particular, we worry about medications that have a side effect where they block the main neurotransmitter in our brain that's responsible for learning and memory. So just to throw out the technical term, again, not that you're gonna be tested on it or expected to remember it, it's called acetylcholine. So medications that block acetylcholine in the brain, either uh, as part of their pharmacological effect or as a side effect, can increase our risk for developing uh, thinking or memory changes. And so this is something that we can see shortly after starting a medication with that type of side effect, or it can be something that develops kind of insidiously over time. So it's not necessarily something that we're going to see right away. 
And as we age, our brain does become more sensitive to this uh, acetylcholine blockade in the brain. So as we age, being on medications that have those types of side effects become more of a concern. And in particular, if we are starting to see some cognitive changes and that kind of thing developing, those are going to be medications that your doctor and pharmacist will probably want to reconsider and maybe see if there's another option we could use that won't have that same adverse effect. Other medications that we worry about for cognitive changes include things uh, like sleeping pills or some of the um, anxiety medications like the benzodiazepines. So those are your PAM medications like diazepam that we spoke about earlier or lorazepam. Um, because not only do these tend to cause uh, drowsiness and um, that type of side effect, but they also can cause memory changes, um, such as confusion and that sort of thing. Um, so those are kind of the big medication classes that we want to consider when we're looking at fall risk and also memory changes. Great. Thank you, Erin. So on to our next question. What are the GEM and SMAP programs? Who is eligible and who can and how can they benefit older adults? All right, thank you for the question. So I will speak first about the Geriatric Evaluation and Management Program. Um, so this is a program that's based out of City Hospital in Saskatoon. And uh, we see older adults on referral from usually family physicians, but sometimes specialists or physicians in the hospital can make referrals to us as well. And so basically we are a team of different healthcare professionals that all work together to try to improve the health and function of older adults. So I'm the pharmacist that works with the geriatric evaluation and management team. And I'm really fortunate to work with a great team of other healthcare professionals as well. So we have uh, physicians and nurses involved with the program. We also have physical therapists, occupational therapists, social workers, uh, recreation therapists, and um, a couple others that we can see by referral. So those include dietitians or geriatric psychiatrists. So a really broad range of expertise of individuals involved with this team. And that's really beneficial when um, trying to improve or optimize the health of older adults that are having uh, multiple different issues going on at once. So often we see people that are having a lot of changes to their health status um, and perhaps taking a lot of different medications that the family physician may no longer know if they're needed or appropriate. So we'll do a really good medical and medication review. We also see people experiencing cognitive changes. And so in particular, our occupational therapists and physicians work to try to determine if it's a cognitive change to the extent that could be expected, or if maybe there's something else going on that might need further diagnosis and, and workup. Uh, we also see individuals that have mental health issues and perhaps need more social supports or an evaluation of whether they're living in the best environment or could perhaps benefit from receiving more supportive services either where they are or in a different place. And so this is where, again, our social workers are really valuable in helping to make these recommendations. Uh, we see individuals that are experiencing declines in their physical functioning, so maybe they're having balance changes or experiencing falls or near falls. And in this case, again, our physical therapists are really, are really important in terms of determining whether perhaps a walking aid is needed or whether some modifications can be done at home in order to minimize the risk for falls. Um, and all taken together, basically our goal is to try to uh, maintain independence and help individuals continue to be able to do the activities that they would like to do. Great, and now talking about the SMAP program. 
Hi everyone, I'm Jesse. I'm going to be going over this. I'm going to be looking into some practical advice and services um, that people can use. And the first one that I'm going to go over is the Saskatchewan Medication Assessment Program, also known as SMAP. And so um, this has similar goals as GEM, uh, but it's a lot more simplified. It involves a 30 to 60 minute interview with your pharmacist, aiming to find problems and address your concerns. Um, after getting the opinion of the farm, getting your opinion, um, the pharmacist can make recommendations to your doctor to possibly stop, start, or change your medications to give you the best possible quality of life we can. And so if you are over the age of 65, um, have a valid Saskatchewan health card, and are on multiple medications, including over-the-counter medications or non-prescription medications, I highly recommend that you ask your pharmacist for an interview. Um, there are some adults who struggle with medication management, like uh, when to take their medication, at what time, um, have they already taken it. Um, and in order to sort of avoid these struggles, a uh, pharmacy offers a service called blister packing. We do it for free. And basically it puts all of your pills um, into daily and weekly sets of medications, have it all organized for you so that um, all you have to do is you have to pop out the pills um, and that will be ready for you uh, to take when you need it. Great, yeah, both programs, very important for older adults to know about and to take advantage of if they can. All right, next question. What are some over-the-counter medications that commonly interfere with prescriptions and disease? All right, so when I say over-the-counter medications, I mean non-prescription medications. And so one thing is that some medications don't get absorbed when our stomach acidity is low, sort of what Erin was talking about before. And there are some medications that aren't really well absorbed when you take them at the same time as other medications. So um, some medications that don't get absorbed well on with low stomach acidity include like iron, vitamin B12, um, and then um, you have to be careful with calcium carbonate too. Um, and it can also bind with other medications as well. So we're, the reason why we're concerned is that if a medication is not absorbed, then it's not going to work. And so, um, Another thing to consider is that there are other medications that can actually worsen your other medical conditions. So big ones include like naproxen and Advil. And the thing about these medications is that they can actually increase your blood pressure or cause swelling in the legs and hurt your kidneys. Um, for some people, it is appropriate for them to take them, um, but it's important to double check with your doctor before you start those things. Um, another thing that people are on are uh, ba baby aspirin. Um, people know it to protect their heart, um, but baby aspirin can increase your risk of bleeds and only some people need it. Um, and then one more thing is that um, herbal products, they're notorious for having drug interactions. So it's very easy for them to uh, interfere with your prescription medications. And so if we look at the next slide, um, I just want to point out like the takeaway is that just because something is non-prescription doesn't necessarily mean that it's safe for you to take. And having said that, that doesn't mean that you need to stop everything that I just mentioned, but the big thing is that you need to tell your doctor and your pharmacist what you're currently taking. Um, and that will help them ensure your safety. And so specific, specifically, if some tips is that if you're taking iron, uh, you can take it with vitamin C, uh, so a glass of orange uh, juice or on an empty stomach, and that will help it be absorbed a little bit better. Another thing is that is that if you take a calcium supplement, um, for older adults, we prefer it if they take calcium citrate over calcium carbonate or other salts, because that salt can uh, be absorbed much better in low stomach acidity. And then finally, um, if you're taking or are considered 
considering taking like naproxen, Aleve, Advil, ibuprofen, ask your pharmacist if it's appropriate based on your own health, because we wouldn't want to cause any problems with your other medical conditions. Great, thank you. So what are some ailments pharmacists can prescribe for and what is the process? Great question. So pharmacists can prescribe for many things, including um, shingles, erectile dysfunction, hemorrhoids. Um, if you're thinking of quitting smoking, if you have allergies associated with nasal congestion, um, some strains and sprains, pink eye, and there's actually a lot more, but those are the big ones that you see with older adults. And all you have to do is you have to ask your pharmacist. And they, what they'll do is they'll do a quick assessment. Um, and if it's safe for you, the pharmacist will prescribe it. If it's not safe, uh, then you will be referred to a doctor. And as long as you have a, a valid Saskatchewan health card, uh, you do not have to pay the assessment fee. You only have to pay for the medication. Um, so this is a great service that you can take advantage of. All you have to do is ask your pharmacist. Perfect. That's great. That can save somebody a trip to doctor's office or emergency room or whatever have you. So next topic. How can I make my medications more affordable? How do I apply for additional coverage through the Saskatchewan drug plan? So this question is really important for a lot of people. Um, sometimes the cost of medications dictate whether we're actually going to take them. And a lot of you are probably familiar with the seniors drug plan. Um, one thing that many people don't know is that you actually are not automatically opted into this plan. And so you have to fill out a form and mail it in in order for you to get these benefits. And for the seniors drug plan, this covers your prescription so that you only pay $25 per medication. Having said this, some people find that the additive cost can be quite expensive. If you're taking 10 medications that are $25 each, it's still expensive. Um, and so that's why I like to mention to people the special support program. So this program, is a little bit different. It's actually based off of your income and anyone can apply for it. And so the amount of coverage is different for every person since it is based off of your income tax. I recommend applying for both of these plans and then the drug plan will choose the one that is most affordable for you. So even if you're already on the seniors drug plan, you can still send in an application to the special support program and they can see uh, if they're willing to cut some of the costs even more. Um, and all you have to do to apply is just ask your pharmacist. They keep some forms behind the counter um, and then you just fill out the forms and you mail it in uh, to the address that's on the top right corner. Uh, of the form. So those are some plans that you can definitely consider if you're feeling that your medications aren't as affordable as you'd like them to be. Great, thank you. So mm -hmm. next topic, I already saw um, a comment in the chat before we started, um, but what are some free vaccines available to older adults? And um, what will be the pharmacist's role in the COVID-19 vaccine rollout? Awesome. So before I address the COVID vaccine, um, I just want to quickly go through, there are some medications that you can get through public health um, for free. And so this would include the Pneumovax uh, vaccine, which is uh, for pneumonia. Uh, you can also get your tetanus every 10 years. If you missed any routine vaccinations from childhood or earlier in life, you can get those for free as well. And then of course the flu shot which is also um, free if you get it from your pharmacist. Um, but in order for the top three uh, points that I mentioned for vaccinations, in order for those to be free, you have to book an appointment at the travel and immunization clinic in the Northeast of Saskatoon. Um, the thing is that if you want these vaccines from your pharmacist, you will have to pay for the vaccine and the injection fee and acknowledge that you can get it free somewhere else. Um, the only exception is the flu shot. Anyone can get the flu shot for free. And so that's it about um, these vaccinations. And so I'll move on to the COVID vaccine. 
So everybody has a lot of questions about the vaccine. Um, and so I just wanted to hit a couple of points. Um, so is the vaccine mandatory? No, it is not. Everyone has free will. Um, we do recommend that people get it, but it's totally your choice. Um, is it safe? Uh, the short answer is yes. I know that some people are worried because it was approved pretty quickly, um, but I assure you there were no steps skipped in the testing of this vaccine. Uh, having said this, there are some people with certain conditions um, who should not get it, but that will be assessed by the healthcare professional um, before it's administered. Um, so something to keep in mind. Currently, uh, we are in phase two of the delivery uh, strategy. So this is immunizing for anyone 67 years or older, along with any high risk patients or um, healthcare workers that were missed in phase one. You can book appointments uh, online or over the the phone. Um, that information is available on the Saskatchewan website. And then uh, one thing to note is that in Regina, I've heard that there's a drive through um, going down to, I think, ages uh, 59 and over. Um, but at the moment, it's closed just because the, uh, they ran out of supply. Um, one thing to note, too, is that when you do get the vaccine, it's not just one dose. It's more than one dose. And so although you will eventually need a second dose, um, it's not being booked at this time or administered at this time, it is important to plan for future follow-up and eventually get it. Um, but appointments are available to book online and over the phone. And so um, you can get help with that too if you, you're struggling with that. Um, in terms of pharmacists, uh, they will eventually be administering the COVID-19 vaccine for free. I'm not exactly sure when, but I know that many pharmacists are taking the COVID-19 training right now, so it should be soon. Um, so even if you can't get the uh, vaccine through your pharmacy um, today, you can still book online uh, or over the phone. And so part of this uncertainty in terms of like timing and booking with um, pharmacies and such is the vaccine supplies are limited and delegated throughout the province. So um, that's why we don't know everything, um, but more and more information is coming out as uh, the time goes on. Great. So next slide is just other general questions that one may have. Yeah, so I'll just quickly go over um, these. So should I share my medications with loved ones? We don't recommend that you share your prescriptions with other people. I know that sometimes uh, we can think, oh, this person might need it, or we have the same medications as my spouse. But the thing is that things can go wrong very quickly. Your loved one could experience an adverse effect um, and uh, medications can get mixed up. So we want to make sure that everyone is safe. So it's best if you don't share your medications with other people. Um, when and how can you dispose of the medications? Um, if your doctor has stopped any of your medications, bring them to the pharmacy and we can dispose of them. This is especially important if you have grandchildren who could get a hold of them. So um, it's important just to keep them out of reach from your uh, grandchildren and anyone around you, uh, even pets. Um, so if you're not taking something, it's best um, to bring it to the pharmacy. And so uh, are there any new pickup procedures? Um, I think this is an important one to go over just because there are some medications, they're controlled medications that require some additional um, requirements compared to others. And one thing is that any controlled medications, um, it's required that uh, a picture ID is shown. And so, and in some cases, um, like a signature in terms of pickup. And I know that some people can get a bit frustrated if they're picking up a medication for their spouse and the pharmacy says, sorry, we need verbal consent from uh, your spouse in order for you to pick it up. The thing is that this is law. This is some like we have to follow the rules. Um, I know it's a bit of a headache, but just keep in mind that um, we will potentially ask for consent um, from your spouse if you are picking up for them, or we will ask for your ID. And so there are some uh, newer medications that are becoming uh, 
controlled medications. One of them is oxybutynin, so that's for urinary incontinence, and then some pain medications like gabapentin, pregabalin, even zopiclone. Um, so just keep that in mind, and don't be surprised if uh, the pharmacy starts asking you questions and such. And then the last question, what should I ask the pharmacist when I start a new medication. So if you're starting a new medication, it's always a good idea to ask if you can take something with food or if it has to be on an empty stomach, just because we wanna make sure that your medications are absorbed and therefore effective. Um, also, it's good to ask if you need to take it separately from your other medications and if it interacts with your non-prescription drugs. A lot of doctors and pharmacists aren't aware of the non-prescription medications that you're taking. So if you inform them, that's going to give them um, a better assessment of whether something is safe or not. Um, so always ask questions about things like interactions and if things can be taken at the same time. And so that's all the information I have for you. Um, if you guys have any other questions, you're welcome to ask them. Great. Thanks, Erin and Jesse. Um, yeah, now we'll look at questions from the participants here. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen so I can see the chat. I can see if he's already. OK. So I have one here. I'm taking candesartan 32 milligrams for hypertension. No pharmacist has been able to confirm whether I can eat grapefruit while taking this drug. There, do we know if this is one that grapefruit impacts? I do not think grapefruit impacts candesartan. So if I can, oh. Sorry, oh, I was just sorry. gonna say I can I can do a very quick uh, search on my pharmacy resources and answer when I find out. Um, but I'll I'll do that right now, okay? And then um, we can move on to the other questions if need be. Yeah, our, our panel, like I would say, it's fine. I, you know, there's a few that we do flag for grapefruit, but candesartan is not one of them. Um, so if that's the only blood pressure medication that you're taking, then it's probably fine. But there is a couple of others that we would worry about. But the candesartan alone should be okay. Okay, I have another question here. Would you list the new vaccines and also old vaccines that we as seniors should have and ha have kept up to date? Okay. I'm just going to take a look at the question again. The new vaccines and old vaccines as seniors. OK, um, I'm just going to sorry, I'm just going to grab something. I have a list of I have a list of vaccinations. Is this um, vaccines like if you haven't had them before or um, if you've had all your routine vaccinations. Yeah, I'm assuming because the, booster shots. What needs oh, to be updated possibly? Okay. Um, so as far as I know, in terms of like booster shots, the main one is the tetanus shot, which is something that needs to be taken every uh, 10 years. Um, and then your, I guess your flu shot every year you can get. Um, I can also look into that uh, while we're waiting. And then, um, sorry, for the candesartan one, I just did a drug interaction search and there's no interaction between candesartan and grapefruit juice. All right, perfect. Um, and then any new vaccines that they can get as older adults, such I'm assuming uh, the shingles vaccine would be one as you have to be a certain age. Is that true? You have to be a certain age to receive the shingles vaccine? Yeah, for the single shingles vaccine, I think it's everyone over, anyone over the age of 50 um, can get that one. And yes, so you can get the shingles vaccine. Um, it, I can't remember, I think it, it lasts a certain number of years and you can always get another one um, after that time. But the big ones are the shingles vaccine and the pneumovax uh, vaccine. And so, um, and then one thing to keep in mind is that I think for both of those, it's not just one dose of 
um, the vaccine, I think you, you have to take a couple doses in the long term, so two or three over the long term, um, just to make sure that it reaches the effectiveness um, that's needed. But um, those are the two big ones, the shingles vaccine and the pneumovax. Perfect. Okay, and one other question here. Um, can medications be sent through the mail? Some medications technically can. Um, in terms of like controlled substances, we typically try to avoid that because there's the potential for someone to intercept that and um, that can cause problems. Uh, I know that pharmacy services, they have um, like delivery. Like, so if you're in town, then what can happen is there will be a delivery driver who will drive around town and drop medications off. But the biggest thing is that it's normally important that um, the person who is getting the medications, like someone is home um, so that it can be passed on because there's always the chance of someone uh, who could steal um, the package on your, on your front door. Um, so yes, uh, medications can be delivered and in some cases they can be sent in mail. Um, it's just we, the person has to be at home when it is delivered like within the city. Um, and then if it's in mail, it's not normally the contro controlled substances, uh, but you can always ask your specific pharmacy for uh, details. Yeah. So. I would recommend to the person who asked that, yeah, just give your pharmacy a call and see what they can do for you in terms of that. Um, I have another question here. Can you pick your COVID vaccine? I'm assuming, can you pick which brand of COVID vaccine you are getting administered? So from what I know, um, like you, at this time, if you book an appointment, um, it would be the AstraVeneca, I think. Um, it's, it's solely based on availability. So if it were something where, say, you didn't want the AstraVeneca, um, then you, I think, like, you wouldn't book an appointment until the other vaccines are available. At this time, you can't really pick and choose. You can only um, get what's available. And normally, um, what they do is, I think, on the website and and the booking, it says which vaccine is going to be administered. Um, it's a little bit tricky when um, picking and choosing too, because then you would have to wait until, um, you know, the government, I guess, uh, supplies the particular vaccine that you want. And then um, the longer you wait, the more uh, of a chance that you could be exposed to COVID and get COVID. And so um, it's a bit tricky. Uh, in terms of waiting. Um, you can't necessarily uh, just pick and choose off of the spot. It would involve a lot of waiting and such. Um, so it, it's a personal choice, but um, you also have to weigh the risks and benefits. Yeah, as of right now, you can't, you don't have the option to pick which vaccine you get. Um, my understanding is though that the AstraZeneca vaccine is not being offered to older adults at this time because of limitations with respect to that data. So it would be one of the other two that you would likely be getting. All right, and when will vaccines for COVID be done by pharmacists is another question I have here. And so that we don't actually have a date for yet. Um, pharmacists have uh, basically applied to be distributors for the COVID vaccine and to give those immunizations and are just basically now waiting on go ahead from the government and availability of supply. And so we don't, we don't actually have like a, a go live date just yet, but um, we're, we're hopeful it'll be in the near future and people are making preparations for it to be as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. From what I know, I know that um, like the, the College of uh, Pharmacy Professionals, um, they've sort of reached out even both to pharmacists and to students um, who are interested in um, administering the vaccine. And it sort of sounded like the potential for um, it to be given like possibly April, May, June, like sort of around that time. I can't give you an exact date or anything, um, but in the near future, that's the closest I can give you. Okay, another one. What is the cost of the shingles vaccine? And is there 
um, a decrease in costs. So is there any coverage that could be applied towards that shingles vaccine? So the shingles vaccine, it is a bit expensive um, in terms, uh, I'd have to look up the exact cost, but I think it can be over $100. Uh, I'm not 100% sure, but um, in terms of coverage, you would have to have like a very specific private insurance, I think. Um, but in terms of like government coverage, I don't think there is any coverage uh, for the shingles vaccine at this time, unfortunately. Um, so I know that the cost can be very uh, limiting. Um, if you do have some type of private insurance, you can always ask your pharmacist if it would cover and then they can see if it would go through. Um, but there's no government coverage or from the um, Saskatchewan drug plan at this time, unfortunately. I just have a note here from somebody who just said um, they just paid $165.80 for one shingled shot. All right, how often do I have to get the Pneumovax vaccine? So generally speaking, we want everybody like 65 and over to have at least one shot of the Pneumovax vaccine. And then after that, unfortunately, we don't really have a very good answer for whether you should get it again or whether the one shot is good enough. So that will depend, I guess, a little bit on your individual health situation because some people with higher risk lung conditions and that sort of thing, they do want to have a booster, um, but the government will only pay for one Pneumovax vaccine after the age of six, like for the age of 65 and over. So if you've had one, that's, that's really what we want to see. And then you can always speak with your doctor, your pharmacist about, you know, if you know it's been 10 or more years since you had your shot, whether you should consider getting another one. And again, if you do have certain lung conditions, that might not be a bad idea. But the flip side is that then you would have to pay for it. Um, but we do know that immunity lasts at like five to 10 years is kind of what we know for sure we can count on. So after that, um, unfortunately, we're just not really sure. It's very hard to do such long-term studies with these vaccines, right? So over time, we don't always know what happens with, with immunity. And that's why, unfortunately, so many of these things are kind of, it depends sort of answers. Mm -hmm. I know I sort of, I, I know before I said something about how the shingles vaccine and the pneumovax, you require like more than one doses or, or something. I think for the pneumovax, you, it's just the one. Um, and then for certain populations, there's like a specific set of uh, different conditions where some people are um, eligible for a second dose um, to be covered, but those are very specific. It might be someone who has um, cancer or um, immunocompromising diseases or um, COPD, um, just because those people would be considered high risk. Um, so again, it's something where you can always contact like public health or um, your pharmacist to see if um, they can figure out if you would be eligible or not. Um, but for uh, the dosing schedule, um, I know for Pneumovax, sorry, it was just um, the one dose for sure. And then um, for the shingles, I, I can't quite remember, um, but I'll, I'll look into that right now. All right, and back to the COVID vaccine. Um, what happens if you miss when you are contacted to get the vaccine? There's a question here. So you no longer have to be waited to um, make an appointment to book the vaccine as long as you're within the eligible population. So you can actually go to um, either the Government of Saskatchewan COVID-19 website to book an appointment if you are 70 years of age and over, or you can phone the number that's listed there. And um, you, you need to, uh, you, you can actually book your own appointment. So if you're, if you didn't get a call and you're kind of wondering why not, or sort of wondering what next steps are, then I just recommend that you go ahead and book um, as long as you're, again, 70 years of age and over. And if not, again, they'll be kind of dropping that age requirement um, as vaccine stock increases and as more people are vaccinated. Um, so just keep an eye on the website for updates uh, when your age bracket is kind of getting close. 
And another question here um, regarding minor ailments, what medications can you write prescriptions for? So maybe just some examples. Um, there's quite a few. I, I don't want to boggle you down with all the uh, medication names and stuff. Um, but I guess, for example, um, say for erectile dysfunction, if someone has already been diagnosed with erectile dysfunction um, and has previously taken a medication, we can um, prescribe like Viagra, Cialis. Um, for like say allergies and uh, nasal congestion, there's like mimetazone. Um, and I'm trying to, I'm just going to take a look at the list of minor ailments that I had before. Um, so for uh, like hemorrhoids, um, that would be uh, like say anusol or um, sort of corticosteroid creams um, for down there. Um, and then for shingles, that would be like if you're experiencing like um, spots on your back or um, sort of signs that you're having um, an infection, we can uh, prescribe some antivirals um, if you meet the qualifications. For smoking cessation, we can um, prescribe uh, Champix, uh, uh, Ver um, uh, Zyban, um, and then uh, for pink eye, um, some, I guess, antibiotics for the eyes. Um, and then I'm just looking for strains and sprains. That, that, the, that one, um, it isn't necessarily for chronic uh, back pain, um, but we can prescribe for, I think, like naproxen, um, ibuprofen, those things at prescription strengths. Um, I'm trying to think of uh, what other ones. Um, it sort of depends on like which um, minor ailment you're thinking about, uh, but there are quite a few things that we can prescribe for um, if you do meet the criteria. Perfect. All right. I think that is most of the questions. Um, I just have a note here from somebody who received their shingles shot that it is one dose and then the second dose is two to six months after right. Those. Yeah, that was and I, yeah, and then I saw in the uh, chat uh, someone said that their question just about the mailing um, was specifically to rural areas in Saskatchewan. I mean, yes, it is possible. I have seen um, I have seen some pharmacies who will mail out prescriptions. Um, it might be a bit easier if um, it's from a pharmacy that has like a post office sort of connected to it. Um, if you're gonna be doing that, you know, give, give the pharmacy a call and ask them specifically if that's possible. Um, and then just keep in mind that if something is being mailed from another city, um, don't, get, don't call in for the prescription sort of last minute, try and call maybe a few days um, at least a few days earlier, just so that they can get it all prepared and, and sent over, um, just so that you're not missing any doses. And then I was, uh, oh, I think I have it here. I was uh, looking at the sort of adult um, immunization schedule. If, you, if you're already like caught up with your routine immunizations, um, the big ones were uh, the Pneumovax, uh, the uh, shingles vaccine, and then, uh, yeah, the tetanus every 10 years, flu shot, um, and I have a note here, uh, it sort of depends on some patients, but like the MMR and varicella vaccines in special populations, um, but uh, those aren't one of the main ones for older adults that you would see, um, so uh, you can always uh, I think on a previous slide, we had um, like a location and a, a phone number uh, there. Uh, if you, I don't know if you're able to um, search online for the uh, travel health clinic in Saskatoon, um, they're associated with public health and they can provide you some more answers in terms of what you're eligible for, um, for things that are covered. Um, so just something to keep in mind. Okay, that is the end of the questions and we are coming to our time here. So thank you, Erin and Jesse, for joining me today and for presenting and giving us all this information. I really appreciate it. Um, our next SCOA coffee break session will be held March 25th regarding housing options. 
For more information about these and other webinars, visit our homepage at www.scoa.ca to register. Please stay on the line after the webinar closes to answer two questions on a survey. And if you do that, you are entered to win a $25 gift card. Thank you everyone for attending and take care. Thanks for having us everyone. Yeah, thank you so much.